welcome everyone to the Zorich Podcast. I am Chris Zorich, and today we have a very special show. It's the one-year anniversary of the Zorich Podcast, and to commemorate that, we have our first guest way back in the Stone Ages, which is Tony <laughs> Rice. Tony is a Notre Dame legend, a fellow teammate, and the last quarterback to win a national championship at Notre Dame. Now, we're, we're, we're not going to talk about that, but that's, that's, that's rough because that was, what, 500 years ago. So. <laughs> uh, Tony, thank you very much for, for agreeing to do this one year later. Like, literally, we did this a year ago this week, so this is really cool. Wow. And I'm not sure if I can add the technology yet, but that show was – I mean, it was bad, man. Well, My know, wife is in there. Pushing buttons and stuff. Dude, I didn't even know how to turn it off. I mean, it was <laughs> it was ridiculous. Now I got stuff like this. Let me let me let me show the audience. I got a little banner that goes across the bottom. You know, I I got I'm big I'm big time now. But <laughs> that 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 first show was just really, really bad. So I just want to say, Tony, thank you for allowing me to spend some time with you on that first show because I know it was rough. Well, I thought you did a great job. Look at something that you haven't done before. And to see how you've grown and look at your professional now. That's I even got I headphones like now. So that's, that's cool. and then <laughs> like you had me back on. <laughs> oh, you're being nice. And then I didn't realize, and I forgot what time we shot it, but I mean we shot it here in the same place, but I didn't realize that the sun was going down. And so, like about halfway into it, the sun started to get in my eyes. And I didn't, I didn't want to like pause and say, "Oh," uh, because it was live, and the sun is just glaring and half, and it was it was ridiculous. It was terrible. Yeah, it's a good thing I'm an hour ahead of you. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I'm my eyes wow. Down. Well, let's let's brag for a little bit. Where, where, where are you currently at? I'm in Miami, Florida. I've been here be two years in July first. <sighs> that is, that is a shame. Yeah. That is a shame. But and I, the reason why I say that, folks, is because he left. His riding buddies, all of his riding buddies here in Chicago, Tim Ryan, Pat Terrell, and myself. He he left the riding Irish, so now we're just the ride. <laughs> we're, we're not even riding anymore. We're just the ride Irish. We still um, have our group. We still have our group. And I'll tell you one thing. I, I miss you guys, but you cannot beat the weather down here. Down that is here correct. Is unbelievable. That is correct. Every that day is, is the same day. It's Groundhog's Day. Wake up to sunshine, and you can ride your bike all year round. As you're, oh, right now. <laughs> I don't want to hear that. I have I have earphones on. That's that, that's that's so not fair. Um, talk a little bit about the fact, and, and we're we're going to cover some stuff because we obviously we covered a whole bunch of stuff in our first interview. But let, let's talk more about kind of who Tony Rice is, and and kind of a little bit about kind of. Not how you got into writing, but kind of what writing kind of means to you. You know, <clears throat> we started off, you know, I I had my license before I got my first bike. I think I, I had my license that. four years before I got my first bike. Right. So, and I used to sit back and just see all the pictures of you guys riding together. I was like, oh, man, you know what? I want to be a part of that group. <laughs> so you guys inspired me, especially you, Chris, inspired me to get my life. You know what? Get my license first, but get my first bike. And I remember when I got my bike, you were the first person to show up, and I was afraid to ride <laughs> in front of you because I didn't want to drop my bike. And um, that, that's still one of the days I'd never forget because you said, you're going to ride it? And I was like, no, that's okay. You know, I just like looking at it. It looks really good. <laughs> <laughs> so, I so remember that. Oh, my God. But then I wouldn't ride it until you left. And, uh, you know, it was just one of those things I said, I got to go practice each and every day. So I used to go down in my garage where I lived at in Chicago and just practice. You know, I dropped it a couple of times, but I, you know, I didn't want the guys to know that I was practicing. Of course. I to be just like you guys and ride in a group. And you said not waiting for me because I'm a new guy riding. So I, I picked up a lot of things from you guys while riding, looking at some of, you know, what to be looking for. But then also... You know, that camaraderie, it brings you back to Notre Dame again. Here we are 30 years later, and we're still number one or number two in each other's life, but we still have that camaraderie together. Right. So that's right. what the writing has done for me. Even though I'm not there, I'm in, I'm in your heart, your spirit. Yes, and, you are. Um, 
That's one of the things I never forget. That's one of the hardest things. Well, I'm not going to bring this up, but apparently you chose, I've seen some photos, and, and you wound up getting some other people you ride with now. Now, I understand that they can't replace us, and I don't mean names or anything like that, but how is it riding with those guys? First of all, you've been riding with you guys for so long, you tend to know what kind of um, moves you're going to make, actions, how you're going to, you know, precautions of doing certain things. And sure. I'm still learning. And you know what? These guys open up their arms to me to ride with them. Okay. Now, we don't have everything in check, but like all walks of life, we have a police officer, we have a doctor, we have two guys that work, you know, blue collar workers, and then you have me. And then you got some other guys that own restaurants and bars around here that we ride with. Okay. So if you need anything, you know who they ask. The right, right, right. Here. That's great. So it, it's fun, but it's totally different. Um, you guys, I bled with on the field, um, sweat with you guys on the field. Sure. And we have something that no one could ever take away from us, and that's a national championship. And we're part of that damn group. All right. Absolutely. Um, have you done any long, long trips with them, or what was the longest – Yes, I, I I rode to Tampa for the Super Bowl. So how far? Oh, how far is that? Tampa is about five hours. Oh wow! Okay, all and right. We went to Daytona Bike Week. A couple, nice. Uh, a month ago. Um, okay. That was about maybe five and a half, six hours. Okay. Oh, nice. And how long did you guys stay? We just stayed for for the Super Bowl. We got there on a Thursday. We left Sunday to come oh, okay. back and watch the, right. the football game at one of the guys' bars. Oh, my God. For Daytona, we did the same thing. Went on a, a, a Thursday, came back on a Sunday. Okay. Yeah. We wasn't nice. coming back on a Monday, but then, you know, you, you get kind of tired of seeing the same thing. So, oh, let's yeah. get on the road before oh, yeah. everybody else gets on the road. And so, the roads are not cluttered. So, as long as you don't, you haven't replaced everyone in the group, you don't have a chef in the group, right? No, we do not. Okay. Thank yeah. God. For oh, those you guys of guys proclaim to be a good cook. <laughs> I made the food yet, but one time one of the guys, Christian, you know, he he made a dish and was very good. Okay. But overall, Rick still has his hand down. Okay. So so for those folks who don't know, so so we've been talking about um, the fact that Tony and I rode at least for 10, 12 years together our, our motorcycles with the group we had here, and we would often go to uh, weekend trips. We went to Sturge a couple times, and we were very fortunate. One of our friends who rides with us is a trained chef. Um, he's cooked at several restaurants. And so it's really great to have a chef with you when you're doing uh, week-long trips because that person, he cooks all the time. So it, it's, it was great. <laughs> so at least you, you you haven't given up on the fact that Rick is still the best uh, motorcycle chef we've ever had. You know, we all have our different traits with the bring, uh, you know, the bring wait, to the table. Wait, wait, wait. We all have our certain jobs, right? Yeah. We bring to the table <laughs> and we all know our roles. <laughs> right. We all know our roles, which, which folks, and this is, uh, uh, there's so many inside secrets here, but as we were kind of assigning responsibilities, uh, the, the term know your role and slow your role and all that stuff came up because we all kind of do certain things and, uh, Rick was in charge of cooking. I was in charge of organizing. And, and Tony, you were in charge of I think entertaining. Yes, you were. <laughs> yes, you were. And I'm so the last clown. Yes. No, 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 no. You, you found us some great places to have fun. Um, and, and it could be it, it's a really great experience. And in a lot of it, when it, and if there's anybody listening who has ridden um, motorcycles before this is going to be kind of old hat for you, but it's about the journey um, and not necessarily about the, the actual destination of where you're going. And so when you hear people on motorcycles talking about it's the journey, it's the adventure going there. Cause I mean, how many times have we had flat tires? How many times have we got caught in rain? I mean, how many times have we been stuck under viaducts like total strangers for like six, seven hours? I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy. <laughs> or, or, or bridges. Um, um, I mean, it, it's just, it's insane sometimes. I remember that one guy it, that we were in Sturgis. No, I think it was in Wisconsin. It was, it was some dude who looked kind of crazy with the long trench coat and he had like the huge knife and everything. And we're like, oh my Lord, what are we doing under this bridge of this dude? Yeah. <laughs> but he belonged to a, 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 
biker club. Which yes. We did. Yes. Yes. So, yes. You know, that was kind of lurry, but you know what? We kept our distance. Kept yeah. Distance. Yeah. And and, and, and I said, at the end of the day, he was he was, he was really cool. Oh yeah. But you know, and it's it's so funny. So if you can imagine, I mean, you got probably like 10, 15 guys. And one of our buddies had a place in Michigan, and so we would crash there. But the enjoyment would be getting riding there, and then going to the store before we got to his house. So now you can imagine, you know, we got ten guys with a lot of food, but we don't have like a lot of ba- a lot of um, space to carry everything. So we'd have bungee cords strapped around seats and people holding stuff and one of our buddies uh i think he had beer on the back and he dropped it and it just it gets really crazy but it's very very wonderful experiences so you know we have those amazing experiences to remember although our guys in miami now but those something you would never forget about because again like you said before <clears throat> you ride with a group of guys that um you know sacrifice their time from spending with their family sure. in order to sure. come and have fun with us mm-hmm. because if, if, you know families start growing and people start you know not being able to do it because they have other responsibilities right and here you are you have us and it's like man this is an enjoyable weekend and we never want that weekend to end but at right. some point you got to go back to work so. right right and, and then and it's great because so for my bachelor party uh we rented a house in michigan and just kind of just that experience. I mean, even though it was like 15, 20 guys, I mean, we, we all kind of did our thing. You know, I mean, p- people went out afterward. People hung out at the campfire. Um, but again, our, our, our buddy who's a chef, Rick DeLeon, was there and he made this phenomenal meal. And everybody, they had the itis. I mean, everybody was kind of in the coma after they ate, after, after they had his food. And it was just a great time. I mean, and those are things that, that we'll, we'll always remember. It was a big slumber party because you had some guys just laying on the couch, I mean, on the couch, and on the floor. And I was one of those guys on the floor with four other my guys that we ride with just having a good time. Yes. And uh, we just like little kids that weekend because, again, you don't get that many time um, available for doing something like that with the guys. Yes, yes. Okay, so that's the motorcycle part. I know mm-hmm. folks kind of tune are tuning in this. To talk to hear about Notre Dame. So, although we had the first conversation with Tony, which half of it you might be able to hear, but I'm not sure. So, I'm going to try to kind of splice in some of the uh, some of the, the the comments from the first show because it was bad. I mean, I didn't even know how to turn the the, the monitor off, and <laughs> I didn't even know how to get off of Zoom at the I time. You did a great job! It was ridiculous. I and mean, now now I got all these kind of cool things. Like, so for example, hello. We got this thing going across the bottom, which is great. I'll leave that up for a little bit. Um, so I did a little short talking, about, and it was called the Zorch Podcast Short, where it talks about kind of, it was just a couple minutes about how uh, Coach Hopes got you to, to come to Notre Dame. Um, and, and folks can kind of go back for that. But I, I do want to talk about kind of, I mean, and go a little bit more in depth because – I know, I mean, you you came from, as Pat likes to call it, you didn't even have socks or shoes, right? So <laughs> you came from South Pat Terrell, by the way. Uh, you, you didn't have any socks and shoes when you were playing football. Um, but kind of going from an experience where a lot of folks in the South, from South Carolina, a lot of folks from the South weren't really keen on Notre Dame. So when you made that decision, I mean, were like, you know, the folks, you know, your family, grandmother, I mean, were they, obviously she was supportive, but like were friends of the family all pissed off at you? Or, I mean, what was that experience like? You know what? Um, if you look back at it, it's so many years ago, back when I was like 18 years old, you, you my grandmother. How old are you now? Like 60, 63? <laughs> 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 my, my grandmother raised four kids and I was one of the four. And, um, uh, population 5,000 in my hometown, then um, everyone knew each other. So when you're playing ball, and I play with my cousins nice. and my second cousin, so our team was made of family. Okay. So we didn't really have a say so. When I say we, my brother and I, about what school we're going to go to, being in a, a Baptist 
a Protestant place. Uh, there wasn't that it seemed like there wasn't that many Catholic, only one Catholic church. Okay. In my, my home, so they said Notre Dame. I was like, ah, you know, it's just another school. Mm -hmm. And my grandmother, she didn't know the get the full understanding of Notre Dame. Okay. Coach Hostess came to the house and said, you know, you, know, you did your job. It's almost like let me do my job by taking care of your your son, because mm. who's already her baby's a son. Um, so he did a magic trick for her, and um, she loved it. So she said, "I was going to follow that little man," <laughs> and she had no idea where Notre Dame was located. And I, I thought it was California too, like everyone else located. Um, so I, I came and took a visit, and. Um, Kind of fell in love. Um, I, I looked at some of the guys that I met. It was how I, I mean, the Juan Francisco. Now, uh, hold, hold on, hold on. When, when you say you took a visit, I'm assuming, like everyone else I've talked to, when you took your recruiting visit, it happened to be snowing. Is oh, that it correct? Was, it was, it was freezing. Yes. Yes. But so again, I'm assuming that you saw snow before at that point, I, or I've never seen snow before. Oh my god! Until I came up there, but again, it wasn't my decision. So, um, Ricky Foggy played at Minnesota. Mm -hmm. He was a coach host, and they thought I was going to go to Minnesota, which they played inside at the time. Right. And um, I was going to be the next Ricky Foggy to take over. So, again, I told her how the weather was. She's like, I don't care. You're going. Nice. So, when I get there, I didn't play my freshman year because of Proposition 48. Okay. And um, I had my roommate, Dean Brown. Um, was there and I didn't have I couldn't do anything I couldn't practice with the team I couldn't lift weights with the team I could not eat with the team except at lunchtime but everything else I couldn't do right so <clears throat> I just got them practice with some of the guys that lived in the dorm and um, just to keep my arm strong enough and in shape and start running a lot and I played a lot of basketball as well I try to play everything so wait, so so at this point I mean what is I mean Obviously, you're 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 on scholarship, but was were, were there any instructions that the football that Holtz or, or Cordell or whoever gave you that hey you know what play basketball stay in shape or you know lift a couple times a week or was that literally were you on your own doing all that stuff? I was basically on my own. I was a regular student. Wow. They had no no inkling of what I was doing <clears throat> as as far as to keep in shape. I used to have um, meetings with uh, Vinny Serrato just to, you know, say hello, how you doing? You need right. in the classroom, you need to, you know, find a tutor for you or anything like sure. that. But as far as athletic ability, they didn't mm -hmm. do anything <clears throat> for me. Wow. Um, I used to look, you know, play basketball at The Rock. Okay. And um, try to lift weights at the, the regular gym and stuff. But I'm like, okay, I have no instructions. But if you look at it too, I was so disciplined in high school that whatever I did, I went back to the basics. Mm. And I, I tried to make the best of it. And it's like, okay, oh, well, it happens, it happens. But I'm, I'm here now. You and, know, uh, and, and it's so funny when you talk about you went back to the basics. And, and I think that that wound up being a theme with our success at Notre Dame because kind of Hulse's version was going back to the fundamentals. And so... You know, and I'm sure you hated doing the fundamentals just as much as I did, but it was repetition. You, you did it. And then when we either lost the game or didn't score as many points as we should have, we would spend that week on fundamentals or we'd spend a couple of days on fundamentals, which for everyone listening, it's literally going back to the basics. So as a quarterback, what did those fundamentals consist of for For, for instance, what Coach Holtz is Louis Leo Holtz time. <laughs> instead of me running the option just think about what goes into running that option first of all get the ball from the center no no fumble and no um, center quarterback exchange should go right but sometimes it, you know it, it goes right, right but sometimes right. it goes wrong mm -hmm. next is that 45 degree angle not 44 not 46 but 45 mm. So he was directly on it. And you know what? He just stopped my play. Look at your feet. You know, get the ruler out. It's like, oh, oh my that's God. 45. I mean, that's 46 or that's 43. Wow. I want 45. Wow. And then it came the repetition. As you know, uh, when you work in the fundamentals, that things will happen and you don't have to second think about it. You just mm -hmm. go ahead and. 
go to the play and you can vis visualize it, everything's happening. And then you go back and look at family and say, oh, I did step at 45. Right, right. Yeah, <laughs> I only did it 7,000 times. I guess I actually did it right. Yeah. So let's go back a little bit about your when you did your first year. Did you compete in big star basketball your first year? Yes, I did. Okay. So now for folks who don't know this, this is one of the largest basketball tournaments in the country, maybe, I think, or at least on college campuses. But, like, literally, it is every – Anybody can get a team. And I think there was a rule where there can only be two athletes on a team, or was it yeah, one? Two football or? players and <clears throat> one basketball player. Okay. Can be on the team. Well, it, it, that was one of the rules. But I know the president of the university, Mike Malloy, who actually played basketball at Notre Dame way back in the day, he had a team. I think it was called All the President's Men. Yeah. <laughs> All right, okay, so he had a team. I know Holtz had a team. You were on a team. I was, I was on Coach Holtz's team. Your first year or no, my first year, my third year, I was on this team. Okay, so 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 you, so you, you were able to kind of as, as you progressed on the on the football field, you were you were able to actually spend more more time with him on his team, huh? By, by his side. <laughs> <laughs> so kind of going on that first year. I mean, do you remember uh, what team you played on your first it year? Was, it was AdWords. Okay, and, um, you're looking at so many years back in 1986. But I Jeez, did. I won a uh, slam dunk contest. Oh, okay. So Hello. I, I was I was pretty decent in basketball, um, in high school. Um, so, decent. Yeah, did you I have any offers there. in high school? Excuse me. Did you have any basketball offers in high school? Yeah, Louisville and some smaller schools. Yes. Really? Yeah. I was going to try to play football and basketball at Notre Dame, but Coach no. Phelps said that it seemed like you guys got something going on here in football. Stick with that. So, wow, really? Yeah, I used to play bookstore. One year, I did not even pick up summer. One summer, I did not even pick up a football. I played basketball the whole entire summer. Really? Yep. And I get, got back to the you know the, the workouts we had the first day you coming back. Right, camp, right. Blowing everyone away because I <laughs> up there. I played basketball the whole entire time. You oh, my God. Go. That is awesome, man. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about your roommate. You talked about Dean Brown. Um, unfortunately, he is no longer with us. Um, but I mean, his nickname was Big Happy. He talked about, you know, I love all you mugs. Talk to us a little bit about kind of what you're like. And, and you guys, I mean, he came from Ohio, you came from South Carolina, you're Midwest, you're from the South. How did that work? Um, it worked out really well because if you look at, <clears throat> we basically grew up without a dad. I, I never knew my dad, he never knew his dad. And you know, to tell him, you know, my, my dad passed away when I was 12, but I only met him twice okay. when I was three. And I don't remember that much in three, but in the right. casket. So Dean and I had a lot in common. Okay. You know, um, my grandmother raised me, his mom raised single parent. And um, um, Dean was one of those guys that <clears throat> didn't let anything bother him. When you say big happy again, he was always happy. And there's a lot of things we could be mad at in this world, but he was never happy. And uh, by me not playing, he, he was the one that boosted my morale and boosted my, my, my energy and trying to be just like him. Mm. Don't let anything phase you. Because sometimes I was out in Beverly Hills, you know, down and out in Beverly Hills, and here he is to pick me up. Because he was giving me insight of what was going on in practice. Okay. Because I couldn't attend practice. Right, right. So he's like, hey, you started something, don't give up. And then at one point, the next year, we roomed together again. And, you know, the other three years, we roomed together. Wow. And it's one thing that they say, never forget the person or people who help you across the bridge. Okay. And he was one of those people that helped me across the bridge to, to go through those hard times and really wanted to go home, cried to go home. But, hey, you start something, you finish it. And my grandmother didn't have 121 bucks to send me home. Mm. Thirty, you finish it. So Dean was a big inspiration for me. And, and, and I think about him sometimes about what Big Happy would say when sometimes I get down on myself. Sure, sure. And um, you know, it, it brings a smile. And I, I know that he's looking down because he's protected me many years. And I think he's going <laughs> to continue on protecting me while I'm on my bike. That's, uh, that's really cool. Um, also, talk a little bit. And I selfishly, I mean... I, I feel some kind of connection <clears throat> only because I didn't play my first year. But, I mean, I obviously practiced stuff like that. But 
it was hard for me. One of the hardest things for me was when we would have a team meeting. And again, I'm talking to somebody who didn't even have that opportunity, but when we would have a team meeting, or I'm sorry, not a team meeting, but it was the the night before game, after we would do our relaxation drills and everything. And then the people who were worthy, I'm going to say that, would get on the bus and go to the hotel. And then the people who weren't worthy would go back to their dorms. But my first year, they thought it would be a good idea to put people in Moreau Seminary, which was <laughs> a place where the priests live. So they put all the football players there. And even though I heard some great stories about those experiences, but even though it was still on campus, I felt I wasn't part of the team because I couldn't do it. And so I say all that to say, I mean, how was it that first year, man? I mean, you would, you'd you'd see guys walking across the quad. You probably didn't even know – who some of the football players were. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, maybe there was not a lot of interaction. I mean, obviously you had Dean would kind of give you like, you know, some, some info of practice and stuff like that. But just, I mean, how was it? Did you, did you even feel part of, of, of a team? Did you even feel part of them? My, my freshman year, I felt part of nothing. Mm. Well, I take that back. The only thing I felt part of is being a student. Sure. Sure. Because I had more interaction with the students than the athletes. So here you are, I've been doing something all your life almost since you were in the third grade and it's sure. been taken away from you. Right. It's like, how are you going to cope with that? And um, again, I had a lot of great people along the way. Father Joe Carey was our rector of our dorm. Okay. Who um, really helped me along the way too. And you find those people that they're there to help you to survive, to get to that next level because as they always say, Notre Dame, they want you to provide all the help for you. Right. They don't want you to fail, mm -hmm. especially be one of those statistics. And I wasn't bound to be one of them. And I think I had those people keep me in check of not being one of those people. Wow. Nice. All right. So let's come on to your, your, your second year. Um, and it was interesting because <clears> – <throat> Your second year was my first year, and my roommate at the time was Kent Graham when I first came in as a freshman. And he was a very different type of quarterback than you were. Um, and, and I think, obviously, it was a different type of quarterback Notre Dame has ever seen. Um, but he was more of a drop-back passer, and you were more of an option god. So, I mean, what was it like when – I mean, you're seeing competition there. I mean, you still had uh, – I mean, there were still other people there. I mean, who were the quarterbacks? It was when Terry and Greasy. I started. Right. And he okay. broke his collarbone in the fourth game of the right. season. Right, and then that's – right, right. So, Coach, they came to me and said, Tony, you're going to start the second half of the game because all the other quarterbacks did the same thing, drawback passing. Well, well, hold on. I want to get back to kind of when, when you were so 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 you you were you're just kind of getting into the meetings. You're just kind of getting to practice. I mean, what's it like when I mean everybody else is like drop back passer, and you have a a different style of quarterback? I mean, what was that like? Yeah, it was very. I, they did not work me that much. Okay. And what he said was, and Coach Pete Cordelli and Coach Holmes, what they said that do what you did in high school. That's basically it. I ran the option. Wow. If Tim Brown is covered with three guys on him, still throw him the ball. <laughs> <So> <laughs> I know my right and my left. And Mark Green used to call the plays for me. No way, really? Yeah, Mark used to call the plays. And then oh I just got there and run it because no one worked with me. But I didn't know the plays. Are you I was serious? more of a scout team quarterback. Oh, oh yeah. my God. I didn't know that. I, used to, I didn't know that. And then when Terry broke his collarbone, when they put me in, and I was like, oh, my God. I lined right behind the guard. I remember this. I, I remember that was kind of that, – that was one of your – Yeah. <laughs> one of the first times you got out there. First time. Oh, I forgot my helmet, my mouthpiece. I didn't use someone else's mouthpiece and helmet. Oh, my God. Yeah, it was just one of those, uh, man, get in there. Go through that gauntlet. Um, do what you did in high school. Mark is going to call the plays. You know, two, four, six, eight is to the right. <laughs> and all the oh odds to the left. That's hilarious. <laughs> well, okay, okay. So I guess I can ask this question because it's important because of the kind of the history 
or you being a legend in, in the history of Notre Dame, right? Um, what was it like the first time you put on that that uniform? I mean, let's just say it's a home game. Although you may not have played, but I don't know how many fans you had in South Carolina when you played, but I'm assuming it wasn't as much as what, you know, the first time you walked in Notre Dame Stadium. So kind of explain – to us, how that experience was. Well, when I first put that uniform on, it was just more of, okay, they gave me a number nine. I didn't really ask for a number nine. Really? I didn't know that either. Yeah. Well, what number did you have in high school? So, again, they take, they strip everything away. You have no say so, Tony. I'm oh going to take this number God. and that's it. What number did you have in high school? 12. But oh, don't forget, really? Ricky Waters already had 12. Oh, that's right. <laughs> it was in Ricky Waters' contract that he's going to win. No, was it really? I didn't yeah. know that. Wow. <laughs> So um, they gave me number nine. It's like, hey, just another number. But one of the main things about it, like Pat always says, you want to look good going out there. So you want to dress to the T. Okay. So I got my number. I'm sliding in. I'm trying to look at everybody else. Yeah, they're wearing their, their pads and stuff and wearing a shirt up and stuff. And I knew I wasn't going to play, but I was going to look good that day. Mm. And my friends would have saw me on television um, that day down in South Carolina. Uh, but, yeah, it, it was one of those things, like just another number. Okay. But then I really wanted number 12. But if you look at the overall aspect, when I ran out there, it's like, man, I've never seen so many people. It was bigger than my hometown mm. in one place. And it was so loud. But, um, it, it, you know, we start warming up. And, you know, God, you feel that energy, that Notre Dame spirit coming through you. And, uh, again, you, I, I want to warm up good. Gotta look good. <laughs> I know I'm not going to see any playing time. <laughs> well, 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 but then also, but but it's also like, I mean, since you didn't play for a year, I mean, the last time you were balling was basically, you know, a year or two years ago in years a sense. Ago. Yeah. Right. And so now, you know, you got the uniform on. You, you, you're you're it's, it's game day. You know, you may not play, but it's still kind of a great experience for you. I think it was a great experience by seeing how many people love Notre Dame. Okay. And how many people were around and giving support and look around it's like wow, there's a lot of people in one, one, one area or one place. And that's that Notre Dame. But, but again, a lot of people were not expecting an option quarterback. Right. And um, they read about me, but you know they want to see how I play. And when we're warming up, we're just throwing passes and stuff. So I remember they put me in a Michigan State game. And my first pass was to Pat Terrell. Okay. Uh, he said, let it fly. And I <laughs> <laughs> Pat missed it. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. It, it was a long ball. They never thought I had, thought I had that arm strength. Okay. Throw it down there. And, um, and then um, they didn't put me in any, any other time until that fourth game against okay. Pittsburgh. So that was kind of a surprise for you then in a sense, right? Oh yeah. So, so what was so then the following game? I, I, I'm going to edit the fact that you're digging your nose out of the show. Okay. Okay. That was disgusting. Thank you. Thank you. That, that was disgusting. I'm, I'm going to edit. I, know, right. I got tissue. I didn't use this right here. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Or, or maybe I'll actually keep it in just because I love you. Um. So, what about the first time you knew you were, were going to start? Right. And so I'm assuming the the following week. The following week, yeah. All that right. Monday, so, how was that? I mean, what was that like? Week of practice for you? Was it like, what the hell? You know, everything been thrown at me. <laughs> right, right. It's from nothing, <laughs> from nothing to like everything. Yeah, and, and I, I had later on meetings. Um, I was talking to Dean on some of the plays. He was telling me the, you know, the technique of they're going to use a certain <sighs> option. But yeah, they they changed everything as far as the running game to more my style. Okay. So they say know your personnel. Um, they do my personnel, you know, what I was going to be, try to do, capable mm -hmm. of doing. Um, so they made it easy for me. It wasn't that many, because I tell you one thing, it made it to a point that I visualized everything. And it's like, man, it feels like high school, but these guys are even faster than the <laughs> too. So, but you love that challenge. You love that right, challenge. right. I'm going to show these guys what I can do. In high school, I used to run the option. I'm in the end zone, 20 yards down the field, and the referee blows a whistle because they thought the fullback has the ball. So, 
I think it went up, Chris. No, it didn't. I was, I was, you were talking, so I was, that was my, that was my smooth direction. Oh, you jacked it up. Man, I gotta get that part out now. That was my kind of, when, 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 when you're gonna be in depth talking about it, then you get the full experience of the full monitor. See, watch, I'm gonna do it again. Watch. Okay. And you jacked it up. You're like, ah, I lost it. No, man, this is, this is part of the evolution. This is different from what last year. Now, like when you're talking, you're gonna be in depth. I could just switch to you. Yeah, I said you never done that before on me. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, that's what I'm saying. There's more in depth now, man. Man, you, you, this, now this I is gonna be a great now stuff. Okay, it. all right, fair enough. Um, so now you're kind of you're, you're rolling now. Your second year, you're you're now the quarterback. I mean, what was that like? Like after the third or fourth game you started, I mean, were you just like? This is a lot. I mean, were you freaking out or? I was freaking out. Yeah, I was freaking out because, again, Coach Holtz put the fear in you. Yes, he did. <laughs> and you got the whole ND Nation looking at you. <laughs> if you mess up one time, they're going to boo me. Right. So my main objective is not to turn the ball over and try to get in the end zone as much as I can um, and call the right plays, even though I just got tossed in there. And I didn't really know all the plays. And then you'll find out how many people love you or hate you. <laughs> no, <laughs> absolutely. So, absolutely. Yeah, you know, my style of play was totally different than everyone else, and um, I'm glad that they said I was one of the people the, um, to pave the way for some of the other quarterbacks that did mm -hmm. the same thing I did. So, 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 what was it like? Life. What was it like coming back from like the dorm and stuff? So now, you know, you, you've been a regular student for a full year. You've made a lot of great friendships that I'm sure you have to this day. So now you come back to the dorm and now you're, you're the guy. Like, like, <clears throat> did they treat you differently or? No, they did not. One? Okay. I'll tell you what, I'm still with friends. Some of the guys that live in my dorm right now mm. and uh, we all get together. They know Tony. Mm. They say Tony Rice, who is he? Because I remember Tony mm. didn't play football and he was in the dorm and they mm. called me Tony and they called me T and I, I love it because that's something that other people can talk about because sure. I can't, because I didn't play football at the time. Right. I was a student athlete, student was first. Right. And um, um, I was talking to one of the guys that we, they said, what you learn on the football field, you carry into the real world. Mm -hmm. And the stuff that coach hosts and some of the other coaches have taught us along the way, I go back to them and it's like, well, I remember when you first got to Notre Dame, you talk like you're from South Carolina. You got an accent and everything. Wow. Now you, you lived all over, but you're still family. Mm -hmm. And that's what I love about it because it can open up a lot of doors and opportunities for for things you want to do because you have been that person that was very humble and didn't do anything um, to um, upset anyone or to um, you march to beat your own drum. Mm -hmm. So... So one of the things I know for a fact, although I was not in your huddles, um, and I talked to several of people that were, um, they, they always talked about you, you had a really positive attitude. Um, sometimes you laughed and joked in the huddle. And, and, and can you kind of share with us a little bit about kind of what your philosophy was going into that environment, although it was high pressure, thousands of, you know, tens of thousands of people in the stands, yet you know, when you came to the huddle, you know, you, you were kind of laughing and joking. And, and a lot of people don't necessarily think about that. They just think about, hey, you go in there and it's crazy. You call a plane, you're out. I mean, sometimes, you know, you, you may not have seen Holtz, what 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 they were um, uh, showing you to, the, the play was going to be, or maybe somebody forgot when they when they ran a plane or something like that. I mean, can you tell us about a couple of those experiences? Well, <clears throat> if you look at it, if your teammates see you, you're feeling comfortable, then they're going to feel comfortable. If they see a panicked look on my face, you guys have a problem. <laughs> because this guy's scared. So right. I, I, I tried to, to massage and everything. It's like, hey, guys, I'll tell you one thing. The guy hit me pretty hard, but the next time I run over there, I'm going to help him up. And, you know, little stuff like that, or just crack a joke. And I'm not really a jokey person, but right. if they see a smile on my face, it's like, hey, we got him. I said, this guy is not going to know where the ball is going to go, and I'm going to, we're going to just execute. And, you know, money, man, Anthony Johnson, we call him money. <laughs> you know he's going to get a first down. 
Right. So I, I can't wait for them to feel the impact that Anthony is going to just go through the line and get two yards or two and a half yards or two and a half yards um, times what? Two and a half, what? Five? Two and a half times five is 10 yards. There you go, yeah. So we needed that. But again, I like them to see me happy, not sad, not mm-hmm. panicky, not afraid. It's just more of like, hey, man, nothing can stop us. Let's go for it. So I hope that energy, you know, got to them. Wow. Right. Right. And, and for a leader, I mean, that, that's extremely important. And we can kind of dive into kind of what your idea of leadership is for a little bit. Um, I mean, those guys look to you even when, you know, they were down by a couple of touchdowns or whatever, or it was fourth and one, things like that. Can you talk a little bit about kind of what football has done for you as far as your understanding of what leadership is? You know, I look at Coach Host has done – Many things in life, in football and after football. And I look at him, you know, wanting me to think like him while I was on the football field. What will um, coach host, want, you know, do or want me to do? Um, and it gets to a point that you always want to please the coach because he's calling the plays. But he points the finger back at you and say, hey, you know what to do. You got to snap back. So that leadership is just more of, I'm the coach on the field. I'm not going to chew you out. That's not my job to chew you out. But my job is to point you in the right direction, just like he's done. And um, he instilled that in me. And I I still think about it, what we do today in today's society and world, we want to do the best thing. And with him and having that type of attitude on the football field, it, it, it really put a smile on my face because they make people look back and when you hear them say something about something that you did to, to make them feel at ease, it, right. I mean, I did my job. Right. So, right. Um, when you were, so it's your junior year and were there any games that, okay, so we'll spend a little bit of time on the Miami game, but outside of the Miami game, like what was your favorite game? in 88. And, and I'm assuming Miami was one of your favorite games. So I, I apologize about that. Maybe it wasn't. You know I mean, what? what was your favorite game? I think USC Okay, was my favorite game because, mm-hmm. again, we went into their backyard. Right. Rodney Pete, you know, one against number two. Right. And uh, we know our defense, we're going to, you guys are going to take care of them on offense. And um, the only thing I had to do is make sure I don't turn the ball over and put our team in the right situation. And uh, we ran the option when I uh, was running down the sideline. I felt like I was far as gun. I wanted to keep on going. <laughs> just that burst of energy that I still had. And I wasn't even breathing hard when I got mm. to the 10 yard line. Mm. So uh, that game was one of the, I think, premier game for that 88 season that um, going to someone's backyard, taking something away from them. Sure. You know, the hostile crowd. Here you are, you know, um, Notre Dame has more fans out in California right. than USC. Right, so right. It's good. Like, we go to their place, we we'll pretend like it's our home, which we did. And, uh, you know, you see the fans happy. You always want to see the fans happy. And sure. you know, I've been called worse by better people in certain, <laughs> certain situations. But um, I just love to, uh, to go in someone's backyard and just, like, have a ball and just, like, you can't control me. I'm taking your ball, you know taking your ball, I'm taking it to my house. Right. Well, and then also, I think what, what folks may not may not remember about the game and the USC game in 88, we were ranked number one there, ranked number two. And then what even made it more crazy, or I'm sorry, what even made it crazier, sorry, apparently I, I didn't do well in English in our name, um, <laughs> was the fact that Coach Holt sent home Ricky Waters and Tony Brooks. Yeah. And those, they were integral part of, of our team. They were starters. And it was, so for me, selflessly, because it is my podcast, um, I'm, I'm going to talk about what, 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 what game was, 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 was that, that I loved that year. And that was USC as well. And only because the meeting we had before the game, 
and I think it was the the day of the game because it was a later game when we had a team meeting. Was that the night before? Or was it? No, that was that was that Friday, the night before the game. I'm okay, okay, all right. So it, it was the night, right? Right. It was the night before the game, and what I found out, which I didn't know, and maybe you were part of this. No, I, I got it. We we left on on um, Thanksgiving Day. Okay. That was that Thursday. Okay, so okay. it's so so they so Tony Brooks and Ricky Waters they missed curfew Friday night, Thursday night. They were late getting to the first meeting. They on, went to the mall on Thursday. Thursday. Yeah, because we flew into um, California. Okay, because we had Thanksgiving dinner on campus. That's right. That's right. That's right. At right. The, okay, I remember that at the South Dining Hall. Okay. So apparently, which I didn't know what happened, but apparently Frank did, and I don't know, you may have been in there, but apparently there was a senior important people meeting. Yeah, I was in there. Oh, of course you were, because you're important people. No. I, <laughs> I was not in there because I was not important. I thought that was important. Um, no. Apparently there was a important people meeting. Um, can you kind of tell us about what what what, what happened? In that? Do you remember what happened? I mean, um, a little bit. Mm -hmm. Because I remember. Well, hold on. Let me, let me tell you Frank's story. Because I remember. Because Frank was telling it, and he was like, "What the hell? What the hell are we gonna do?" And so he was saying, if Andy Andy Hack didn't speak before him, he was gonna be like, "Man, we're we're done. Like like we're gonna lose." <laughs> and apparently Andy Hack was like, "No, we're gonna do this. This is great. We're, you know, we have the team. This is everything." And so Frank was like. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm gonna see what he said. <laughs> yeah, you know what? In my mind, I'm thinking it's like, okay, our backfield is one of the best in the nation. So, you know what? I don't know about this game, <laughs> but if you look at Mark Green stepped up to the plate. Oh my God, this he did. Pat Eilers, what the hell? Ever. Right. So you, you never know your number's gonna be called up. Right. In that right. case, you got two of the, the top guys, and they've been sent home. And I remember talking to Ricky, and Ricky was like, he thought it was a joke until they got to the airport. Wow. And it was, really? he started crying. Like, no, oh, I didn't know that. It's, it's really? in his head that, you know, this is real. And uh, wow. I remember and, you know, people were asking me about it, and I was like, no comment. Right, right. You know, right. I'm a snot nosed junior. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it's, it's, it's also your teammate. I mean, you, you don't want to. Dog your teammate out either, you know? No, you, you don't. You don't. But again, you're looking at responsibilities. He gave us responsibility to be on time. If you're not on time, you know those doors are going to be shut. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, it put a lot of fear. It made people think, like, man, we're not going to win all now. But Absolutely it did. Yeah. yeah. So that, the after fact of it is like, man, we didn't really get lucky because we had people waiting to right. play. Right. So... Right. You never know what's going to happen. What if it didn't? Right. Right. Exactly. 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 And, well, and then, so after the important people meeting, <laughs> then y'all came into the, the the regular meeting with with the regular folk, and I think Holtz may have said like a couple words. I mean, he he told every the whole team at that point that he sent Ricky uh, Waters and Tony Brooks home. And then he literally said, and I remember this vividly, he said, seniors, this is your meeting. And he walked out. Yeah. And I was like, what the hell? What the hell? What the hell? What? 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 They're not. What, what's, what's going on here? And I remember Andre Jones, unfortunately, <laughs> rest in peace. Yeah. He, got, he was like, man, we're not going to win. We're in trouble. Blah, 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 blah. And I was like, oh, my God, we are. And then Frank got up and he was like, this is bullshit. We're a team. We're going to be, and I was just like, and so for me, like being a snot nosed sophomore and, you know, thinking I knew what, 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 what it was like being on a team. And, and I'm thinking like, you know, Hey, you know, camaraderie important. And then all of a sudden it was like, what, wow, like for me, that was by far, that was my favorite game that year. Mm -hmm. And that's probably one of the most important games that, that made that type of impression on me that, no one is more important than the team. Yep. And he felt, Lou felt, that regardless of what the outcome was going to be, that he had to teach them a lesson. Yeah. And, oh, by the way, we're ranked number one, USC's ranked number two, 
it's Holtz's third year. There's a possibility we can play for the national championship, but he sent those guys home. So for me, it's kind of like, like what's it? Well, again, what's important now? Something else we couldn't learn from Coach Holtz. But the idea of kind of, well, what's important? Are the rules more important than what happens with the team as a result of someone defying those rules? Now, like you said, it could have gone the other way. Yeah. We got the crap beat out of us. We, we could have got our ass kicked. And then what? Right? Yeah. And I, I look at it too, and he brought some good points. Um, certain people, you know, certain people in the meeting, and a lot of people didn't understand because we, we went through the whole season undefeated. <laughs> and we had a lot of young people that were playing yeah. who really didn't understand kind of, you know, what was going on. I mean, I know at least our class, and we had a bunch, I mean, we had a whole bunch of guys playing. Shit, we thought this was gonna be every year. So it was like, whatever, we don't see, whatever. We win it next year, it doesn't matter. Yeah. But so so you had that laissez fair attitude. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Oh no, no, no. It's more of again what you just stated. You know, a, a lot of people that they probably haven't been in a situation like that. Mm -hmm. when, it, when I say a situation like that, listen, everyone thought that Notre Dame win all the rest of the games when you're there. All the years are gonna be there. Right. But it can take one or two people to really mess it, mess it up or oh. to help out. And we don't know. And when that got tossed in, and been in that meeting, it's just like, no. And I got goosebumps by thinking about it because these guys are very valuable to the team, but then also people are waiting to play as well. Mm -hmm. That hasn't, that have not even shown their talent right. what they can provide. Right. But then, you, you, okay, you got Mark Green in there. Great job. You know, I tell you what, Mark is one of the, um, the non-selfish guy um, that would do anything for the team. He's one of the captains. So with him, he could have said, hey, listen, they got to stay because I can't carry the load. Right. No, he put, see, he put all that on his shoulders. That's my job. And here I am. I said, I got one job and one job only make sure I put my team in the right situation. Mm. Don't worry about personnel. Mm. Personnel, it comes with the territory. That's the coach's job. Right. Not me. Right. So whoever's in there going to get the ball, you better run. Wow. And then we can tell a joke in the huddle later on. That, that, that's no way. And that's exactly, and I think that's what a lot of people, or at least I haven't heard until I started doing this podcast, right? I started talking about that game with people and like when Frank was telling the story, man, I started getting like I started getting goosebumps and stuff, man, because I was like, damn, I didn't realize there was that meeting beforehand. And the fact that how he felt about it, and he was nervous too. And I mean, it, it's a funny story. He talks about, you know, if hey, if Andy didn't say, Yeah, we can do this, I would have been like, No, I'm a, you know, hey, we're gonna lose. <laughs> but you know, it's, so it's interesting. So, you know, this is again one of the life's lessons that we learn as young kids that help us later on in life, right? And so I'm sure when I'm making major decisions in my life, I realize that, hey, you know, no one's important in the team. And when you have rules, you have to stick with them because if you don't stick with the rules, then what are they, right? Yeah. <clears throat> You're right. You're right. Um, I'm a movie buff, as you already know, and yes, I've been watching a lot of martial art movies. Okay, like, nice. Um, 70s and- uh, Nice, so I love it. Doing that during this pandemic. So, and some of the things they talk about, it's like, wow, they've been talking about that for years. Right. And here right. we are talking about something right. like that, you know, with discipline. Right. When you're working right. out, you got discipline, you got to focus. Right. But then it's called responsibilities too, to your family, to your teammates, and to your friends. I don't like that on television, which they use today. Right, right. Well, what's, what's one of your favorite ones that you, you remember watching? Um, the Drunken Monkey. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you know, you pretend to get drunk and you don't right? like yep. stuff. And, but I don't know, but all of them you learn something from. And then you look at the sound effects. Oh my God. The sound effects are loud. Oh They're my bumping God. skin. Right, right. Like they're breaking bones. I mean, dude, and then I don't know how you were, but we used to, so you could also see them on TV, but then you could also go to the movie theater. But sometimes after we watch them on TV, we'd go outside and we start doing karate for the next three hours. Yeah. Well, you're out. Because right now, I, look, I watch it on Prime. Prime okay. Video. 
Uh-huh. I, you know, I got one after the other. And I always look at what kind of language you're going to speak because I don't like to see the subtitles. Right, right. No, I, I remember. Like, the voices don't mix. Oh, right? yeah. Well, and then, do you remember uh, the one with the five rings? The, the, the dude had the five rings on his... Uh, and then uh, uh, there was another one that I really liked. It was the five uh, deadly venoms. The, yep, I was going to say that next. <laughs> where, 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 like, each person, like, there was a turtle. I remember there was a turtle and a spider or a scorpion or something. And they wore the little mask. Yeah, yeah, they had the mask <laughs> and stuff like that. Yeah, See, man, that's, that's part of the childhood, man. You know, you're born in the 60s, man. That's what, you know... I was watching that's what the Monks. Yes. And everything now. Yes. So, yes. 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 But, but um, right there, like I said before, it brings you back to reality of everything right. else that happens in your life. Right. So, so I was fortunate enough when when we had coach. Oh, so first of all, I'm sorry. Um, I don't have it going on the ticker, but you are listening to the Zorch podcast with our guest Tony Rice for the one year anniversary of the Zorch podcast. So I decided to have him back on. Because our technology is a little better than it was then. <laughs> so, and I know how to turn stuff off. And it even gave him a little feature that he freaked out on. So I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to warn you <laughs> next time when you have your own feature. Um, when I had Coach Holtz on, it, he was great. But then toward the end, he kind of talked about something. And I didn't even bring this up. But he talked about one of the games that he regretted. Um his performance or, or coaching. And he talked about the 89 Miami game. And he like apologized. And he was like, you know, if I could do that better, or if I could make a better decision, I would have done it. And for those of you who might not know uh, what happened, what he's referring to is we were, we had gotten a lot of fight, a lot of skirmishes and stuff before the games. And, we went down to Miami. It was a really hostile environment. Um, I heard they were spitting on priests, priests and stuff like that. I didn't see it, but that's what a lot of folks said. And it was just a crazy environment. And their players start talking crap. We start talking crap. And I remember, like, literally, they were on this side. Our team was on this side. We're, you know, we're talking about all this other mess. And Hopes kind of jumps in. He's like, get back, get back, get back, get back. And when he took us, when he got us back in the locker room, people were fired up. I mean, we're pumped up. We're like, I'm gonna kick their ass. You know, fuck, you know, we're getting hyped. And Holtz basically told us that if we got into a fight, he was gonna resign. And that took every possible. I mean, how did you feel about it? Because I mean, I'm, I'm obviously talking about how I felt, but well, same way. So again, they let the air out of us <clears throat> as far as. You put that stipulation that listen, you fight, I'm uh, I'm going to resign. Right. Hey, man, we don't want to pull now, so we start cowering back. Mm-hmm. If he would have let us go, and I say us, yeah, I love to take part two well, for tape. Absolutely and right. This is my team as well. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So when he said, everybody, like, man, we, 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 what's going on? We got punked out in a way. Right. <laughs> and, and I'm not saying you didn't compete, Tony. I'm not saying I didn't compete, but. He took that edge off. And, and, and that's something that we needed. I mean, we were in their house. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I mean, we we needed to, co- to compete in that way and be aggressive and allow our players to kind of play how they played. But when you when your coach makes a threat and says, hey, I'm going to resign if you guys get into a fight, like, whoa, what, 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 what? What? Where did that come from? <laughs> exactly right. Well, well but yeah. but then also though, I mean, you know, and, and really thinking about it, I mean, he was under a lot of pressure as well, because what was going on was that Notre Dame, the, we weren't those choir boys anymore, right? We we were we were willing to to if somebody punched us, we didn't turn the other cheek and walk away. We punched back with two punches instead yeah. of the one they punched, right? So I mean, it wasn't so much as hey. We're gonna walk away. I mean, you you punch us, we're, we're gonna try to beat the shit out of you. You know, so it wasn't this type of of, of reputation that they've had. And so he was apparently getting a lot of heat. And it wasn't just so much that he made the decision and said, "Hey, I'm sure you know the pre- I'm sure folks were talking to him about you know we, we don't like the way this is turning. Um, you know, we're we're getting the fights and stuff like that." Okay, it's easy to say right there for them, for the people that are not out there doing, doing that grunt, doing that Absolutely. Work. 
But I tell you what, we're going to roll over and let them beat us. Right. As far as physically beat us. No, no. And that's one thing that I thought, you know, the coaches just take that out of it. That's our job. Right. But, but don't take the air out of your team. Right. Stated something like that. But right. again, my main objective was to call the plays and, mm-hmm. you know, Miami had our number that yeah. night. And, um, if we can do it all over again, which I will play today. I'm right. down in Miami territory right now. So right, I'm exactly. Like Paul, Steve Walker, <laughs> I mean, there you go. All those guys out and, and just play. But it, it feels good that we we can always go back to reminisce. And we said we had some great years. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. But it, it, but you know, in Holtz's defense, I was really shocked that he kind of volunteered that. And I mean, that was one of the first. That may have been one of the first times I ever heard, ever heard him say, "I'm sorry." You know, I was like, "Damn!" You know, can I kind of view this? I'm not sure, but you know, this is kind of nice. But you know, it was just one of those things where it was like, "Wow!" Like he felt, and obviously years later, but you know, it was just one of those things where, you know, as he got, he probably realized, like, I mean, imagine, I mean, had we beat them. We would have had back to back, you know. We, we would have introduced Tony Rice as the two-time national championship quarterback in Notre Dame, you know. Yeah, but you know, I look back and say, "What if?" And I say, "You know what? It is what it is." Right. We're still the last one. <laughs> <laughs> you are not right. You're not right. Um, okay, so as we start winding down a little bit, um, want to talk to you about. Throughout your kind of time with Notre Dame, just in life, it doesn't have to be from Notre Dame, but do you remember kind of a lesson uh, one of your mentors may have told you and maybe something you, you may live by that you learned from one of your mentors? Well, again, it goes back to Dean. I'm looking at Dean. I'm looking at my high school coach. I'm looking at Coach Holmes. I'm looking at some of the players um, and some of the priests at Notre Dame. Um, all those people – were a big impact for me mm. and looking at where I came from as far as <clears throat> going from point A to point Z in a very fast time. <laughs> right. Which very fast, it's fast time getting there, but it was only like three, three years. Mm-hmm. So it's a lot of stuff cramming in your head. And I don't want to forget all those people that helped me along the way. Sure. As far as to make Tony a better person. And, um, you know, trying By to the way, the right did you just life. speak about yourself in the third person? I just want to make sure that I heard you correctly. You just <laughs> said Tony. Okay, sorry. You're right, Christopher. You I, I right. Just, I'm just trying to make sure, you know, I just, uh, Christopher wants to make sure that he heard correctly. That's all, that, that's how it sounded. I'm like, Tony, I see that's what happens when you get in Miami. Tony you start right. speaking in the third person. Jeez, I'm uh, kidding. I'm kidding. So I'm kidding. those people, uh, I, I just want to thank them for, you know, having patience with me because mm. – you may have to tell me it three or four times before I get it, you know, stuck in my head. And um, um, those people that are no longer with us today has became a um, uh, um, big impact that I even use some things to my kids and say things. It's like, I can't believe I just said that. Mm. And here I am older and I was there <laughs> once their age. Right. I was like, well, dad is smoking something. I don't know. Right. Right. <laughs> right. 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 Exactly. But, uh, I don't know. You know. There's a lot of people got to think and a lot of people that I've Taking, um, I taken um, verbiage, mm-hmm. uh, wisdom, some of the fine things in life with me, trying to mold Tony. That's speaking in third person. Here we go. Right, where okay, he is right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, one of the things that I I enjoy the most about kind of doing these podcasts is kind of having the chance to kind of hear stories that I wasn't part of, right? So for example, the, the, the one where the important people had a meeting and the, the, the scrubs weren't in that meeting, but, um, <laughs> you know, cause it's so fascinating. Cause you know, although you didn't talk to me while we were there at Notre Dame and Pat didn't talk to me, um, <laughs> all the, all the upperclassmen didn't, didn't talk to the, the naive stuttering kid from Chicago, but it's so interesting when I talk to guys who either I didn't play with or that I didn't spend a lot of time with, it's so interesting to kind of hear their experiences 
And so along kind of those lines, I mean, what's one of the kind of most – so, yeah, I'll give you an example. So for me, because this is my show – I'm sorry, this is Chris's show. Well, again, third person. There you go. Um, one of the things I enjoyed most was the camaraderie, obviously. But it wasn't that – I mean, it was special during the summer because we were there for summer school. And there weren't that many students there. There were some students there, but there weren't that many. The basketball team was there. Uh, I mean, the women's soccer, I mean, volleyball, I mean, all those, I mean, the, basically all the athletes were, were there in the summer. And I thought it was really great because we, we didn't have athletic dorms, but this was our chance to kind of live, because we all had singles, it's like I lived next door to somebody, you know, and so it was so cool. So. I mean, I remember in the dorm, we used to keep our doors open, and, and it was just a blast. And so those memories are the things that I enjoy. I mean, yes, winning the last championship was great, don't get me wrong, but it's those memories that I always have. So kind of on those lines, like like what was what's kind of like your most memorable moment in their day? Well, there's two things. I like what you said about that part because mm -hmm. that's when all the athletes get to know each other. Right, exactly. And then, then it's different sports. Yes. Basketball, baseball. What the, I didn't know they had baseball. So, okay, baseball. Uh, so, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Chris Asaro. Chris Asaro. Christopher? No, you're okay. So, that's one. And I, and I, I love that because, again, uh, interaction with them because they have a busy, you know, whatever season they're in. Right, right. Sport. And we don't have that much time to spend with them. But mm -hmm. in the summer, and I never thought about it until you brought it up. Now, looking at the other part, for me, for me, I, I had a bigger task than I put on myself, that I put mm -hmm. on myself, is mm -hmm. by getting my degree. Okay. And um, there's a lot of people that doubted me along the way. And I, I just felt like I got to take it upon myself in order to get what I want to prove them wrong. Mm. Um, I'm going to work my butt off. And I did. And then, then you find out the ones who jumps on the bandwagon. We knew you can do it the whole right, time. Right, right. It was like, wait, where, where was your ass? That was in the thick of it. When I needed you. Right, right, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So it got to a point right there, you know, just me walking um, and getting my degree, having my grandmother mm. um, to come there to see mm. that because mm. it was a long journey. Mm. You know, people thought that you know Tony Wright wasn't going to amount to anything. He mm. was being a quarterback at Notre Dame, mm. and, um, and here I was crying like a little baby, wanted to come home my freshman year. <laughs> I didn't really have to tell that story, but I'm sharing it wow. because times were tough back then. Wow. Uh, it didn't cost that much for me to go home, and we wow. didn't have it for me to come home. Wow. So. See, and, and so then, I, I, you know, I think about those small moments, right? Because so I had Tom and Doza on, and, and I know that you know, you, you know Tom very well. And he talked about a moment where someone in the dorm, the 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 RA, and I forgot who it was, but the RA kind of pulled him aside and said, you know, hey, you know, you're, you're doing all this partying stuff, and you're really not taking this seriously. And that was kind of a wake up call for him, right? And so I, I talked to him about, you know, what would happen if that RA didn't didn't kind of mention that, right? Or, or or didn't kind of stop you at that moment mm -hmm. and say, you know, hey, you know, you need to take things seriously. You're a senior, blah, 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 whatever. And so he kind of like, yeah, I never thought about that. So I would think that like in that case, if you had that $121, or if you were able to kind of go home, and I mean, I'm sure your grandmother would have kicked in the ass and made you come back, but I mean, what if like you went home because it was so hard and you never came back. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't know what, and my grandmother put it in more terms too. Once you uh, graduate, don't come back because there's nothing there for you. Mm. So you listen to your elders. And if she would have, yeah, she probably had 121 bucks. She, right. she could right. have right. But right. she did the right thing. At that time for me, because she did not yeah. raise a quarter. She did all she can so we can get to that next level. Put food on the table, closing your back. And the only thing that really helped my brother and I out was playing sports. We played every sports that were allowed. 
Mm. And um, yeah, our hometown is 5,000 people. We, uh, again, they kept everything open. You get your butt whooped at um, someone's house, you get another one coming back home. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> we even got to the crib. We even got home, you know. Yeah, I don't want to go home. <laughs> <laughs> It's uh, it's it's interesting that you say that because I remember my first year, um, it was hard as hell. I, academic probation, my first semester, wanted to come home. And interesting that you you say that because my mom said that what do you have to come back to? You know, I'm here, but you have an opportunity that a lot of people don't have. So when you're going to come back here, it's the same. I mean, people are doing the same stuff that they've been doing here in this neighborhood for a very long time, and that's not a lot. Yeah. And, and so they, they don't want to see you succeed either. Right, right, right. Exactly, exactly. And so, but but then it was kind of like I realized kind of like what, what you did with, with, with your grandma was like, wow, you know, this is, this is pretty important. And so although I did not graduate with a 4.0, I took school more seriously after that. And realize that, you know, hey, this is a, a, a huge responsibility, not only to me and my mom, but to my family and to my neighborhood and to everybody else. Yeah. And, and then it's I even get I start freaking out with when I say that what if Tony Rice had left his freshman year because it was so hard? I mean, I wouldn't have a national championship ring. I still went to Notre Dame, but I wouldn't have a national championship ring. <laughs> I'm just saying. Yeah. So you guys would have won one. <laughs> nah, nah, no, no, no. But thank you, thank you, thank you, Mister Mister Modest over there. But no, 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 no. Oh, yeah. We would yeah. definitely not have won a national championship if Tony Rice is out there. Way too kind, my brother. Way too kind. It's just the truth, yeah. bro. This has been great, um, and, and I kind of liked this because it was more relaxed. It wasn't high pressure. I didn't really know what I was doing, but now I do. And got the crawler going going uh, down, and I have a script which is kind of cool now, right? So before I just kind of was winging it, but but I have a have a script now. So now it's my turn to say some stuff. So I'd like to thank everyone watching and listening to this episode of Zorch Podcast, and most of all, my wonderful team of my wife and daughter Candy and Kylie for helping me direct and produce the show. This podcast, along with our others you'll be able to watch on my YouTube page at youtube.com slash chrisresorts50. As well, you'll be able to listen to it on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your favorite podcast. See, that was new from before. See, this is this whole script is new, bro. Hey, man, this is big time. I love it. This is big time. Also, check out the description below because we have a list of books from Amazon by our other podcast guests like Lou Holtz, Jerome Bettis, and others. Look at that, man. This, this, this is big time now, bro. I'm crying. I love it. See? I love it. Before, I was like, how you turn this off? You know, not. remember? <laughs> it was good. So and what I'm going to do, I'm going to try to splice some of that uh, some of that episode into this into this show somehow because it was, it was just, man. I mean, what I'm able to do now, and I got really a legit, microphone now i got my headphones on now you know i got a nice little camera before man i couldn't even hear it was it was bad but like, you know hey, you evolved it's, it's been a year it's been yes a sir year, and yes, i think one thing there's a stepping stone for everything you do hello so came from the bottom now you're here there you go <laughs> right yeah right so so now now i have four listeners before i had you know none but now thank you for 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 for, for being on the show tony this was okay. great again uh, can't wait to see you again in person. Uh, let us know when you're coming back to the Chicago area. Um, and I'd love to have you on in the future, but it's going to maybe, maybe be like another year because, you know, or maybe I can do this like a yearly thing, you know, as, as I evolve. You want, you know, be cool. Oh, that's so it. nice. So nice. <laughs> All right, brother. Thank you. Love Take you, man. Care, brother. Love you. All right. Take care. Bye.